Hello, everyone. My name is Romy Gutierrez, Director of the University Press of Florida, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. Today's panel, African Diasporic Arts and Social Change, is part of a virtual event series made possible by a Sustaining the Humanities through the American Rescue Plan grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. We would like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities for its support. We would also like to thank our event partners, the University of Florida African American Studies Program, the University of Florida Center for Latin American Studies, and the University of Florida Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere. And now a few pointers and guidelines for today's panel. This webinar is being recorded. After the webinar, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel, Florida Press. Registrants will receive an email after the webinar with a link to the recording. Closed captioning has been enabled for this webinar. To view the closed captioning, please click on closed caption in your meeting controls. If you have a question for the panelists during their presentations, please put your question in the Q&A box. We will pass along your questions to the moderator so they can be addressed in the Q&A session after the panelists have finished their presentations. I would now like to welcome our panel moderator, Dr. David Canton. He is director of the African American Studies Program at the University of Florida, where he is leading the school's ex expansion efforts to build the program into a full department. He teaches in the Department of History and specializes in 20th century African American history, the Black freedom struggle, civil rights history, and hip hop music and culture. He earned his PhD in history from Temple University and he is the author of Raymond Pace Alexander, a new Negro lawyer fights for civil rights in Philadelphia. He is presently working on two new book projects. The first is Radio Active, Turning Moments into Movements, which he is co-authoring with Joe Madison, The Black Eagle. And the second is a biography of the influential African-American historian, Lawrence Dunbar Reddick. And with that, I turn the screen over to you, Dr. Kenton. Well, thank you, Romy, for that kind introduction. And again, I'm Dr. David Canton, Director of the African American Studies Program. And it's my honor and privilege to be the moderator for today's session, African Diasporic Arts and Social Change. So I'll go ahead and read the, the, bio, the bios of each in the order of the uh, presenters. First, we have Dr. Jane Albert, Albert, Albert Destin Coraline currently teaches in the Department of English at the University of Puerto Rico, Arecibo, specializes in creative writing, particularly poetry, speculative fiction, and short stories, as well as women's visual art and writing in feminist literature and thought. She earned a PhD in English from SUNY Binghamton. A fellow of Cave Canem, her creative work is published widely in anthologies and collections. She is co-editor of Art and the Artists in Society, and a forthcoming book of new poems in the colony of everything is expected later this year. The title of her presentation today is Adjacent and Transitional Spaces in the Poetry of Arena Leon, Raquel Salsas Rivera, and Peggy Robles Alvarado. Second, we have Dr. Erica Moya James, currently teaches in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Miami specializes in modern and contemporary art of the Caribbean, African, and African-American diasporas. She received an MFA in painting from the University of Chicago and PhD in art, art history, and visual studies from Duke University. Author of Love and Responsibility, the Dawn Davies Collections, and a forthcoming book is entitled After Caliban, Caribbean Art in the Global Imaginary. She's the founding director and curator of the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas. Presenting today, the Jeffrey Holder Project, Assessing Private Black Archives, Reimagining the Print Publication, and Rendering Multimodal African Diasporic Art and Artists in the Academy. Next, we have Dr. Marquise L. McFerguson, currently teaches in the School of Communication and Multimedia Studies at Florida Atlantic University specializes in critical media studies, hip hop studies, gender studies, and intercultural communication. Received his PhD in communication studies from the University of South Florida. Among his publications is the book, 
Conversations in Color, Poetry, Prose, and Paintings, and his chapter, Outcast Black Mus Masculinity, recently appeared in Reimagining Black Masculinities in Public Space, Essays on Race, Gender, and Activism. Award-winning spoken word poet who has performed throughout the United States and internationally, presenter of TEDx Talk, Art, Social Change, and Uncomfortable Conversations, and a frequent instructor in performance and poetry workshops for communities across the nation. Presented today, Remixing the, I the Ivory, a visual audio ethnographic album examining, examining how Black academics experience and reimagine academia. Next, last but not least, Dr. Thomas de France, de France currently directs Slippage, an interdisciplinary performance research group at Duke University, and is moving into his new position in the Department of Theater and Performance Studies at Northwestern University. Specializes in performing arts and dance, African American studies, and gender and sexuality. PhD in performance studies from New York University. Author of many articles and several books, including Dancing Revelations, Alvin Ailey's Embodiment of African American Culture, which won the 2004 De La Torre Bueno, bueno Prize of Society of Dance Scholars. A number of choreography, dance, creator, and production credits to his name in both theater and mixed media. His presentation today is titled Performative Scholarship and Social Change. So first we have Dr. Coraline will start us off. Each presenter will have 10 minutes and I'm gonna put my mic on mute and let's, let's go at it. Uh, I'd like to first thank um, Sean Hunter and the team at University Press of Florida for giving me this wonderful space to share with these brilliant minds. So thank you very much for the invitation. And I've cut uh, the, the time to only two poets that I'm gonna talk about, uh, Raina Leon and Raquel Salas Rivera. Adjacent transitional and transactional spaces to power in contemporary Puerto Rican X poetry. This study of work in progress <laughs> is inspired by a need to highlight the bodies of poetry that defy and define the inexpressible. I will attempt to understand how the contemporary problematic of the poem is a site of engagement for the Puerto Rican writer, not only between the traditional notions of land, space, and self, but also in the confrontational crux between the black and brown body in place and in transition within those spaces. I will look at how the body becomes a transactional space and whether in this transaction, something is exchanged or lost and whether these works reject the fixed aya, aka, mainland versus island story, or if they invite a new narrative challenging the static binary notions of the standards or the standards of the imaginary other. My study explores how the contemporary Puerto Rican poet rewrites the Black self through form and space so that all the voices find shape. In visual poem, White Death, Raina Leon uses the device of collage, photographs, snips, census records, and the written word to reveal a transaction of erasure. In Quayle, she writes, quote, in this visual poem, I'm exploring collage and hybridity with archival records and family photographs. White Death explores how one of my ancestors has her race changed on official documents and becomes white at death. Leong's painful revelation opens a third space where the poem subject and the poet convene and confront their truth. The discovery then becomes the poet's inherited present, a phrase I'm borrowing from scholars Andrea Gill and Pula Pires. But must this inheritance continue in the same shape and state as it started? In the census record, it was missed, forgotten, or neglected. The lie becomes the truth, the legacy. Leon does not delete it or erase it. Through the visual poem, Leon's collaging makes the word blanca, white, which had been adjacent to the main story, now centered. The inheritance of lie becomes the story. Therefore, she gives it a platform from which to speak, 
floating in the middle of the visual poem like a signpost. The poem engages the partners by bringing the past and present into dialogue. Sylvia Winter in Unsettling the Coloniality of Being Powered Truth Freedom argues that, quote, that blocking out of a black counter voice was and is itself defining of the way in which being human in the terms of our present ethnoclass mode dictates the self, other, and world and how it should be represented and known, unquote. By repositioning the word Blanca, Leon flips the script and whiteness against a black space becomes black. Now the next poet, in Araceli Hermay's poem from the Black Maria, the speaker reimagines astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson's youth as he is regularly confronted by macro and microaggressions, read uh, whiteness and police on his excursions to view the stars. In the poem, the boy is susceptible to the various humiliations and suspicions of the white gaze, which deem him suspicious and dangerous. Quote, and you might have known somewhere quiet in your gut, you might have worried for him in the white space between line and fix and six, or maybe even earlier, and you might be holding your breath for him right now because you know this story. Like Leon, Kiermai's poem transforms space so that it is no longer the boy's journey, but ours. In the scene, the reader is called to read space. The reader is called to also enter the space and ultimately admit they recognize the space. It is a meta moment where the reader faces not only the subject, the speaker themselves, but importantly, the poet, a complete confrontation. And then the third poet. In Sala Rivera's, in Raquel Sala Rivera's book, While We Sleep Under the Bed is Another Country, Sala Rivera's poems break open a new space by transitioning the reader to post Hurricane Maria disaster through the public's lens, providing substance and contrast to the crass miscalculations of governance and the mainstream media. Though everyone suffered the storm, not all suffered the same. Most often than not, black bodies were neglected or forgotten. On uh, page number 74, which she presents as an end note, a speaker reveals, when the camera stops rolling, they look away. Away here, I argue, chronicles two locations or vantage points. The audience's amazement, curiosity, shock, while the camera is on, or the camera's inability to get the whole picture. Community leaders in Loisa, a community which have long been uh, ignored and continues to be ignored by the capital in matters of economic and social development, complained that no camera had visited their neighborhoods to record the losses left in the storm's wake. In Loisa, at 20, and this is, I'm quoting, in Loisa, a 24 pack of bottled water sells for as much as $21. In Las Piedras, it's 34. However, in San Juan, where much of the city is quickly recovering, the same 24 pack is $4. And San Juan is the capital. Uh, at the time of the article, Luisa's community members had not been visited by FEMA representatives for over a month. Anthropologist Hilda Dorenz writes in Black Perspectives, quote, forced migration, displacement, and natal alienation are core features of this unjust system that still perpetuates race-based privileges and inequalities. On page 53, end note, the speaker speak, repeats what seems to be an anthem, quote, oh, to be white, America. Oh, to be white, America. Oh, to being white, America. Is this voice from the center or from the margins looking back or down? The response at the bottom of the page is its own translation, though it's not a direct translation, it's a response to the end note, quote, and I'm translated it for you here, quote, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico is birthland. I would not exchange it for anything, even if they pay me in capital. The layers of transaction devoted to sites of whiteness, the word play, the repetition, is reminiscent of an anthem, but the anthem dies with the first speaker, as the second rejects any interchange with that America. The second confronts the colonial narrative, much like the tradition of bomba, exposing truth 
against what was lost, misunderstood, or neglected between colony and mainland, the ironically official report and the media. Francophone studies scholar Gladys M. Francis offers an analysis which is gerund to the erasure of narratives of trauma among Black bodies in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, she offers that quote, oral traditions inherited from Africa played a part in the resistance to colonization that involved conditions of loss of memory and troubled identity formations, as well as psychosomatic and physical traumas, end quote. To contract the disaster experience onto the page, Salas Rivera leaves a wide white space between the dialogues, a stark landscape that carries its own performance of loss and transition. This wide white gap, this blank space, like in Leon's visual poem, is a transitional space between one body and another to denote the time, to name the time, to record the time it takes for black and brown bodies to be heard, if at all. Because ultimately buried in the inheritance of coloniality, who tells your story while you live it? Scholars Gil and Virez posit that asking, quote, what serves us is precisely the kind of political thinking necessary to take on such difficult dialogues in the gendering, racializing, and class practices that sustain the inequalities and violences that mark the contemporary world. They occupy a third space in which those forgotten figures find their agency by becoming the haunting figure under the empire's bed uh, while they sleep in another country. The work continues for today's poet as they build a new space for the multiplicity of bodies whose repositioning decenters the tired narrative, what scholar Andrea Gill and Bula Pires call our inherited present. As they clear the field, these poets build new pathways for generations as they unveil trauma, kill back the palimpsests, and challenge the dominant story, whether it comes from hegemonic sources or narratives from the same migrating bodies that transitioned before them. Thank you so very much. I look forward to hearing uh, all the other presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Dr. Erica Moya James. Hello, everyone. I just, as I screen share, I just want to say thank you for the invitation uh, from University Press Florida. Uh, I will, I need every minute. So I'm going to just, <laughs> I'll just start. I work primarily in what are considered emerging fields in the discipline of art history. Fields that would have been impossible without the push to decolonize scholarship through interdisciplinary approaches and for whom traditional archives are often difficult to access if they exist at all. In my work, I've had to rethink what an archive is, what form it takes, and how to challenge the authority of traditional archives that have, that have historically excluded information around things that I'm drawn to, yet remain the barometer that determine the value and the validity of my work in the academy. In terms of field discipline, I am drawn to work objects, figures that lie outside the center of my discipline, work that is not rendered or remains invisible in the traditional confines of, of it. And therefore, in my mind, art and artists that have the potential to transform and extend the discipline through other critical approaches and methodologies. The arts of the Caribbean, the Americas, and the African diaspora, fields that center my practice, require interdisciplinary approaches to be rendered. At times, the work is also multimodal and formal, but situated in, in such a way that is contrary to mid-century American abstraction, for instance, and its interpretation of formalism. The work in my, in my fields exhibit what we call meaningful form, formalism, even in the absence of content. A project I am working on right now is in a wonderful community of artists and scholars is forcing me to think of ways to do this kind of work even more precisely to work in a place of possibility by challenging our scholars to develop new methodologies and approaches to this type of work, even as we center archival access and reimagines which form archives may take. The Jeffrey Holder project focuses on the life of Jeffrey Holder and his prismatic approach to global black arts rooted in painting. His work demonstrates the infinite histories and traditions of, uh, the infinite histories and traditions a multimodal interdisciplinary artist can harness 
despite debilitating setbacks and criticism throughout his career. His oeuvre has never been taken seriously in the academy, and why? In part, it's because he doesn't fit into a single disciplinary home, and as such presents a problem of methodology in the, in the academy. Born in Trinidad in 1930, Holder arrived in New York City in the early 1950s. Soon, he was being photographed by Carvin Becton and cast in Truman Capote's and Harold Arlen's musical production, House of Flowers. This show brought together for the first time a transformative generation of African diasporic performers. Set on an island in the West Indies, the show starred Pearl Bailey and featured Diane Carroll, Carmen de Lavalard, Alvin Ailey, Arthur Mitchell, and Holder, among others. Within months of its production, Holder had married de Lavalard, mounted his first one-man show of paintings at Baron Gallery in New York City, and begun a working relationship with Ailey and Mitchell that would span their entire lives and include seminal choreography for both the eponymous Alvin Ailey Dance Company and Mitchell's Dance Theater of Harlem. The work, this work alone should probably warrant attention or attention on this work in the Academy. However, this has not been the case. As an artist, Holder's painting practice grounded his entire oeuvre. In it, he first understood the notion of Kunstwillen or the will to create. From his intimate knowledge of painting, all else sprang and that all else is quite vast. Holder was not only a painter, and these are some of the uh, samples of the work that he has done in the Caribbean and in um, the United States. Ooh, it's going slowly. Oops. His work as a dancer, his work as a choreographer and costume designer, his work as a, the director and costume designer for The Wiz, for which he won Tony Awards. He even worked as a model and a pitchman and as a film actor, um, as a fashion designer, he designed all of Carmen de Lavalade's um, gowns for all of the events. Oops, I'm missing. And he was also an author and a recording artist. I am continuously amazed by him. However, partly because of his artistic range, Holder is often regarded as a dilettante and his seminal accomplishments in multiple areas of the arts are dismissed collectively. And yet without him, the full history of American and African-American dance, the history of Black Broadway, the history of American and Caribbean figurative painting, particularly the political histories around representations of the Black body, histories of global Caribbean modernities, histories of Blackness in American cinema cannot be fully told. The lack of scholarship engaging Jeffrey Holder's life and work illumines that despite the talk of interdisciplinarity in the academy over the past 20 years, the reality of institutional support and the development of field shaping methodologies that would effectively challenge um, the ambivalent support and bring value and respect to interdisciplinary scholarship at an institutional level remains lacking. This project sees this omission as a systemic error in the academy, and in its wake, an error of interpretation of artists like Jeffrey Holder, whose work exceeds the disciplinary frames that make knowledge visible. This project seeks to reimagine the limits of those frames. It re-engages Holder in a manner that crafts new intermedia and interdisciplinary approaches to the study of African diasporic arts through the development of a print publication and an accompanying and an, and an accompanying digital platform deeply resonant with the process of archiving, archival access, cultural memory, and the production of history. The project centers on the process of cultivating new public scholarship and the development of more accessible critical archives that illuminate Holder's full range as a painter, a dancer, an actor, a choreographer, a director, as a costume designer, photographer, collector, and artist. It works to reestablish Holder as an African diaspora creative whose multidimensional practice constituted a highly conscious vision of our world and provides the critical and methodological architecture for a more prismatic study of global Black arts. We are fortunate that Holder understood the value of his work and lived for this present future. 
This project is centered on the organization, accessibility, and deployment of the privately held Black Archive built by Jeffrey Holder and held by the Holder Estate in New York and New Jersey. This archive provides a wholly unique and unprecedented resource for multimodal interdisciplinary African diasporic arts research. And this project seeks to utilize this resource to produce field forming um, scholarship and archival practices in service to black arts and scholarship. I wanna end by reiterating three core values of our project. First, it, it views Holder's interdiscipl interdisciplinary multimodal art practice as possessing the critical architecture needed to establish clear and deliberate methodologies in the study of African diasporic art, and in truth, the art of the Americas. Second, it aims to develop a new accessibility model to private Black archives. And third, it seeks to establish new methods in research and delivery for fundamentally interdisciplinary new fields of studies, namely Caribbean, African American, Latin American, Black Atlantic, and African diasporic visual, art, dance, film, performance, and literary and cultural studies. It recognizes that while these fields intersect, they are not the same and that black studies can engage all of them simultaneously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have Dr. Marquise McFerguson. I'm muting and sharing my screen now. All right, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Before I start, I would love to uh, say thank you to uh, my family and friends who I've also seen have chimed in. Thank you for your support, but then also thank you uh, for allowing me to be a part of this panel with such brilliant minds. Um, I look forward to sharing my work, but then also uh, continuing to possibly work with uh, some of the professors on the panel in the future. Uh, and also thank you to the University of Press of Florida. So I will share my screen and begin. All right. All right here we go. All right. So the work I will be talking about today or discussing is a remix in the ivory, which is a um, a visual autoethnographic album that explores the uh, lived experiences of uh, Black first generation graduate students. Um, and the, the work Remix in the Ivory seeks to do two uh, important things. One, uh, it seeks to kind of um, expand or I guess add literature uh, to, within communication studies um, that focuses on the unique uh, obstacles and experiences of Black first generation graduate students. Um, in particular, within communication studies, this is not something that we see often explored. And so uh, hopefully the remix in the ivory can contribute to uh, contribute to the lack, uh, lack of research that is uh, published within the field. Also too, um, another thing that I seek to do within with the remix in the ivory is build a bridge between the academy and the, uh, the community. I, um, for me, being a first generation college student, it is much of my research is so important for me to either, even in an essay form, write research and write in a way that is um, appreciated within academia, but also can be uh, respected and appreciated and valued within, within the general public. Uh, because many of my family members may not have access to the academic journals that I publish within. And so I'm always trying to build a bridge with my scholarship between uh, the community uh, and also uh, academia or the ivory tower. Um, so I will, tell you a little bit, I guess for me, the best way I uh, thought to kind of break down Remix in the Ivory and um, is to kind of tell you the inspirations of the project uh, or what inspired the project uh, and then kind of give you a detailed uh, overview of the project in itself. And so um, the project is inspired by Bell Hooks and her concept of home place. Uh, and in particular, when Bell Hooks talks about home place, she talks about this idea of the spaces and places that kind of help create and uh, shape how we see ourselves and how we see the world around us. And so when I was exposed to uh, Bill Hooks and her concept of home place, I began to think about my own uh, home places and the spaces where I've spent an uh, extended amount of time. 
that kind of helped shape who I am and how I see the world. And in particular, one of those spaces I wanted to explore was academia as its home place. And when you look, when you think about it, um, if say for instance, someone goes and gets a PhD, so you spend roughly uh, at a minimum four years getting your bachelor's, two years getting your master's, and then another four years getting your PhD, uh, at that point, you spent a decade, <laughs> close to a decade, if not more, within academia and higher education. And so uh, you could, this is very much a home place for you. Um, and so I wanted to look at the unique experiences and challenges and obstacles um, that Black first-generation graduate students have uh, within predominantly white institutions. And so I want I can't touch on all the themes that I explore within mixing the ivory, but a couple of those themes would be, say, for instance, and I found these themes to be present across disciplines. When I began to develop a network of friends and colleagues across disciplines, uh, and in particular those uh, Black colleagues I have who were first generation uh, students, but also uh, attended predominantly white institutions, you have instances where um, navigating microaggressions and racism. Um, but in particular, understanding there's a politics at play on how you respond to the racism and microaggressions that you experience, not wanting to um, live up to or fulfill this angry black man, angry, angry black woman tropes. Also um, navigating uh, academic spaces in which often, um, often you don't see pe uh, people who look like you or scholars who look like you represented in the syllabi that you are provided in classes. And so navigating that, understanding that I have to not only read uh, the uh, course materials that are presented to me in class, but also try to find scholars outside of class that kind of resemble the background that I come from. And then last but not least, um, so many times I would talk to scholars and they would talk about this idea of being trained to work twice as hard. Um, my mother, well, neither my mother or father had an opportunity to go to college. And so when they were trying to prepare me for college, one of the things they told me told me was, uh, remember, no matter what, you have to work twice as hard as everyone else uh, and understand you can't be just as good, you have to be better. And that too pushed you towards this ideal of quote unquote black excellence, well, no, however you want to frame that, but also in pushing yourself harder and harder, not uh, so many other scholars I talked to talked about this ideal of um, not understanding the value of self care. And, this, and so when you're pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing yourself, but then not understanding the value of self care and how that can cause uh, you to get off balance. Um, and so those are some of the general things that I cover in remixing the ivory. Um, one of the things that kind of inspired me to do the project and try to create a visual album was um, when you look at hip hop studies, um, oftentimes we analyze content as hip hop studies scholars. But when I was doing my dissertation, I had a committee member who said, while you're analyzing content, it will also be beneficial to, for you to possibly analyze aesthetics as well. And, and in particular, what can we as scholars within academia learn from hip hop uh, hip hop artists um, and the way they communicate their message to the world. And so right around that time that uh, I was beginning to think about that ideal and how can we as scholars learn from hip hop, uh, hip hop artists and hip hop culture in general and what can we take from the culture and bring into the academy. Um, uh, right around that time, A.D. Carson or Dr. A.D. Carson, excuse me, published uh, the first peer reviewed rap album with the University of Michigan Press uh, and it was titled I Used to Love to Dream. And for me, that was groundbreaking because I didn't know this was even possible as a scholar to do work like this and to be counted uh, within an academic press. Uh, oftentimes I felt like all my creative work that I would do within academia uh, would be seen as like cool, but not necessarily be seen as valuable within uh, the academy. And so while I am not a rapper by any stretch of the imagination, prior to going to get my PhD, I had spent uh, over 12 years doing spoken word poetry, traveling across the United States and throughout the UK performing. And I always thought that I would have to leave that part of me outside of academia so I can do like real research. But when I got into academia and the PhD program, and in particular communication studies, uh, I started looking at the work of uh, scholars like Aisha Dorman, and Robin Boylan and Javon Johnson and the other scholars listed on the screen that were also using poetry within communication studies. And so I began to see that it will be possible to 
um, use my poetry, in particular spoken word poetry, as a mechanism to kind of communicate the scholarship that I was uh, doing. And so fast forward to Remix and the Ivory, and I think I got the idea to try to test this theory out of being able to possibly use, uh, looking at hip hop, this idea of when you look at hip hop, hip hop videos and the pro pro how it helped uh, proliferate hip hop across the world. Um, and so looking at, okay, well, if we're going to draw from the aesthetics of hip hop, how can I possibly do this as a test run? And so I worked with a, a filmmaker and a professor at the University of South Florida to develop this short, uh, short film about black masculinity and in particular uh, looking at emotional uh, vulnerability. And so we, um, it was poetry based, uh, backed by a spoken word poem, but also it was uh, steeped in uh, research that kind of examined and analyzed black masculinity uh, from an autoethnographic lens. And we did the video and we were like, okay, I was ready to get turned down uh, by uh, academic journals. Um, I was like, okay, I don't know if this is gonna work. And lo and behold, it got published within the review of communication uh, in 2021. And I was ecstatic because it meant for me that, okay, this work can exist within this space. And so kind of using the um, hip hop metaphor, um, Kind of using the hip hop metaphor, if that was quote unquote a single, then how could what would it look like for me to go from a single to produce a um, album or a series of short films that kind of analyze one topic? And so that kind of gave birth to me wanting to do um, do a whole album or series of short films that kind of analyze the, the unique experiences of first generation, uh, black first generation graduate students and uh, explore that uh, using not only spoken word poetry, but autoethnography, but also uh, film. And so that is the uh, project that I'm currently working on, which I have got grant funding for. Uh, and we will be shooting the short films this, um, this summer and hopefully the goal is to get them published within a university press, but also use them as a tool to travel to different universities to talk about the unique experiences that Black first generation graduate students have and hopefully begin to shift the, shift the climate and uh, I guess have dialogues about how can we not only help Black graduate students survive graduate school, but also thrive in graduate school. Um, and so that is my time and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And next we have Dr. Thomas DeFrance. Thank you for that. And what an honor to be in this panel. I'm not nearly so organized. I just thought I'd talk a little bit and share some ideas, but I'm just so uh, excited at the connections that are already in the air, Professor James. Yeah, I'm one of the few people I guess writing about Jeffrey Holder as a dancer. So we have stories to tell each other and writing about House of Flowers and there's so many interesting things about um, um, Jeffrey Holder um, as a person and also in that exchange. You know, actually that was a show that George Balanchine was hired as choreographer, but he was fired. And Jeffrey Holder actually choreographed all his own material for that work. So there's just so many interesting things to keep building out as we're thinking about, you know, these kinds of um, diasporic sort of exchanges that produce uh, new ranges of scholarship. And Professor McFerguson, I just want to lift up um, how uh, what you're up to is exactly what um, I wanted to speak towards was this idea of performative scholarship and social change. So sometimes I think we imagine social change as a barometer of social relationships that are outside of the academy or the ivory tower, if you like that language. Um, I just also want to lift up, though, that as we are more present in the circuits and in academic publishing, we change the terms of how the publishing operates. And we change the terms of what constitutes the social and also what constitutes scholarship. So I just wanna lift the, the four of us or the five of us or the, all the folks who are on this call who feel compelled to say they are connected to um, a life of the mind or academic thinking or scholarship or what have you, um, because we are actually the people who are shifting it or making it different than it was. 
Um, I think a lot in the spaces of philosophy and aesthetics, I actually write in black aesthetics. Almost everything I write is uh, about dance because I am a dancer myself and love dance, believe in dance. Um, but that's also helped me understand over the last 15 years how to change the ways that I want to try to write um, through and alongside and lean in with other people um, as a researcher and an academic and an artist uh, through questions of Black thought and Black presence and Black studies. So um, I do want to just lift up that we're in a kind of transitional moment. And I think there's a lot of evidence in the four different projects we're sharing with each other today um, that there's just lots of ways to get uh, a, a kind of practice of study and make that available, um, as was just said by the speaker before, for folks who have not had the opportunity to practice and study. Um, because you know, if higher ed or academia are trying to do anything, I would hope that we're trying to learn how to ask the questions that'll help us figure out how to care. I think this vector of care as a way to imagine scholarship, and it shows in, up in Bell Hooks' work all the way through. Um, Bell Hooks was, of course, super interested in care and love as vectors of Black life and ways to think of philosophy. And you know, part of the challenge is that um, until pretty recently, until the social justice movement, these sorts of terms have not been considered intellectual or academic. So the kind of shift from the 60s from the civil rights movement, you know, which was much more about um, us having access to the spaces and the resources and the context building uh, to reimagine what black studies could be as we had moved on from W.B. Du Bois' sort of visions of what that needed to be as a sociologist into other ways to think about black life. Um, this idea that, that things like girlhood, black girlhood, or a kind of um, radical queers of color, uh, like these questions really are, are shifting and reorienting what it is to write or what it is to create scholarship. And then we get to be a part of the, the maneuvering towards this something else. And it's pretty recent that we've been calling this black thought, I think, um, but there's something really useful in this, this sort of formation where we're acknowledging that um, there's a point of view or an aesthetic uh, imperative to things like rhythm, uh, to concepts like uh, Sankofa that we look back to imagine forward. This sort of like conception of entanglement is super important for black people and black people in diaspora. And so we're kind of shifting the terms of what philosophy and scholarship um, think they were about because we just have a different different point of view, I want to say, maybe, uh, as we kind of work through Black thought. So this means that storytelling and ethnography become much more important. We heard in presentations before today these ideas of, of kind of like um, lived experiences or first-person narrative. So um, taking the, 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 the stance, if we're trying to decolonize classrooms or engage in anti-racist pedagogies, so then taking the stance that what students bring into the encounter of the classroom constitutes the exchange of the classroom means that it matters how we enter, when and where we enter, how we approach each other, how we decide to be near each other. So, you know, Black thought has really uh, encouraged us to actually pay attention to each other rather than thinking we're chasing art or we're chasing dance or we're chasing some other thing that doesn't necessarily have people um, doing things around it or through it, um, but that is some sort of like object. Uh, so this has been a, a real shift of the last 15 years. I would, I would offer up for our conversation. Um, also the rise of Afro-pessimism, I think is still trending. And Afro-pessimism um, gives us a way to understand a kind of um, uh, uh, Shango or warrior energy around uh, black thought, especially in 2022 that we're concerned with claiming, maybe if we're following up for pessimism, we're concerned with claiming the space of the disavowal of the human. So black people have been disavowed and constituted as the, the space or the register of the non-human. So then Afro-pessimism leans into this idea and then we keep exploding out with concepts like wake work from Christina Sharp or 
um, this idea of becoming human from Zakia Jackson. Um, and so we're asking questions about things like the wake or trauma and pain, or literally the weather. How do we actually navigate the weather if the weather is anti-Blackness? So these sorts of shifts in, in um, philosophy, which in Black philosophy, we might wanna call Black thought, have helped us really shift how we write about artworks or think about artworks or creative address. Um, I have a question around this in terms of, and this is really an open question, I don't have an answer here. But one thing I am noticing as we're figuring out how to express ourselves um, among these ideas that are already circulating, um, the sort of space of the personal as being exceptional, I'm not sure about that. Because I do think we need to gather around some shared stories and commonalities. And sometimes there's a way that um, things that are entirely ethnographic or what some researchers are calling autoethnography, um, it can be a little confusing about how to put the stories near each other to kind of produce a, a, a way of us to, to know together or learn together. And I do think the reality television has something to do with this. So Black thought and 21st century um, Black scholarship, I wanna say, encourages us to be in relationship to popular culture because we create so much of popular culture. Uh, there was a researcher, I think it was John Schwed, uh, who said, you know, while Black people are 12 or 14 percent of the U.S. population, um, we produce something like, and he actually put a metric on it, something like, you know, 82 percent of the popular culture that the world enjoys. So as we shift towards paying attention to the things that we care about as Black people, we're shifting the terms of philosophy and scholarship in really important ways. I want to offer just a couple examples of performative writing. This is the kind of writing that I tend to do as a researcher and a scholar that helped me bring my artistry forward. And um, I did earn a degree in performance studies, so I kind of had a way to, to think about performative writing, even as a graduate student many years ago. Um, but the idea of performative writing is that you might write from inside the topic rather than outside of it. So rather than trying to force a performance to cohere as an object, we might write from inside the activity of the performance and see if that produces something. So I think my time might be pretty much done, but let me um, offer just a couple rather than three. I don't think I have time for all three, that's all right. So um, I wanna um, just share two really short things. One is actually a complete idea, it's just super short. So here's the screen, this is the image that goes with this piece. And um, this is a tiny, tiny piece that I wrote for um, a journal. Uh, and it's quite short, so I'm just gonna read it to you. It'll take like two minutes. And this is for a piece that's called Black Dance and Technologies of Wellness. Crawling one face next to the next, we practice moving with care, a care for black queer. Hairy, gaping femme, lips on chin, cheek, and temple, breathing kindness towards the group, especially the one in the center. There for now to be replaced by the other soon enough. The photograph offers a moment of the multi year, multi sided project, Let Him Move You, initiated by Jumatatu Po and Jerome Beecham. The work explores dances of an explicitly contemporary African diaspora moved across locations and circumstances to emerge in museums, experimental theaters, nightclubs, and neighborhoods. The project affords a cutie pot group of artists, and cutie pot is queer trans people of color, the opportunity to play and commune moving intentionally through the afterlives of dance created in black spaces of celebration and pageantry, competition and collective practice. A moment of ecstatic exploration, allowing breath exchange, eyes blurry, spirit opened. What if we loved in a queer black male femme sunshine? How could we feel ourselves healing in public? So I'm gonna stop there with appreciation at this assembly and excitement in our conversation to come. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank all the panelists. Uh, we have some questions in the chat. 
So I'll go ahead and read in the order that I receive them. Uh, here's the first one. I'm always interested in how your art practices sometimes trip you into new spaces of thought, body, and other unknown. And the intersections of Asian race, gender mixes with, with and beside Black practice studies. Ooh, is that a question or a statement? Uh, the intersections of Asian race, gender mixes within and beside Black practice studies. Anybody want to handle that one? Can you see the questions in the, can you see the questions in the chat? I see. I'll take this one just because Catherine Mazur is, is an old pal, and I, I know Professor Mazur. I'm sorry she had to leave, but I saw that she had submitted that question. Okay. And you know, you. again, thinking about like Blasian studies or mixed race identities, which is a part of uh, Black thought and Black Black caretaking as well. So many of us are mixed. So I think as Professor Mazur in this question tilts us to think about uh, mixed race identities and how blackness operates like in Japan and you know, and <laughs> where we have so many mixed race children of um, soldiers who were there during World War II or Vietnam, et cetera. Um, so blackness keeps expanding and our art practices land in unexpected places and have incredible volume. So then of course our scholarship is also gonna reflect uh, these openings towards other vistas. Thank you. Thank you. Um... A question for Dr. McPherson from Jane. Wonderful project. I'm curious to know if students approached you who had never thought of performing poetry, hip hop, or were these students already comfortable with that medium? Um, yeah, so I think uh, definitely have a lot of students who, uh, well, first, thank you for the question. Um, and I, I definitely have had students who, who have approached me about this project um, and will say like, wait, first of all, we can do this in academia. Like, uh, I never thought of being a professor before, but if I can do this, uh, then I may think about it. Uh, I had a residency, artisan residence uh, opportunity at the University of North Texas recently, and I talked about the uh, Remix in the Ivory project, but then I also had to do a performance. And there were a number of students who came up to me afterwards and said um, the performance was with, within the lens of spoken word poetry. And they were like, I once again, I never thought about being a professor. Uh, but if I can do that and I can tell my story that way, then I would possibly think about doing this. And that was powerful for me. And I make, I'm unapologetically unapologetic about it. And I'm very upfront that I think I've done workshops where I've had strong students who were beautiful writers, but didn't necessarily want to go the MFA route, but they were beautiful spoken word poets. And, but they were like, when I got to, when I get to college, I have to major in something real. And it's like, no, you could do this. Uh, and I think like you, there's nothing wrong with bringing who you are and your culture into the classroom through the way that you write. You know, this is connected through like the Black Arts Movement and uh, Gil Scott Heron. And like this is this is very much as legitimate as any other uh, group of artists and writers in the academy. I just put it that way. Just because you aren't taught this in the academia doesn't mean that it isn't it's any less legitimate. And so, yeah, so a lot of students, especially students of color, Black students have been inspired by it. So I'm excited about that. Great. I have a question. This is for Dr. James. This is my question. I didn't learn about Jeffrey Holder until the Seven Up commercials, Boomer Eddie Murphy's Boomerang, and the James Bond film. Do you think his contributions are marginalized in Black popular culture? So I caught him on the tail end. I know all the other stuff, Alvin Ailey, all the other stuff. So where does he fit? You know, but definitely the Seven Up commercials and Boomerang is where you know. I'm glad they put him in the film with Earth a Kid, but all the stuff that prior to that, I had no clue. You're on mute. Um, he's definitely underknown. And I think what this project um, has really taught us or taught me is the stunning range um, of his practice. Uh, and you, 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 you mentioned the word, where does he fit? I don't think Holder ever wanted to fit anywhere. You know, I think that notion of fitting in was almost antithetical to how he understood himself. 
-hmm. and his practice. Um, and perhaps that has been part of the reason we don't know enough of him because you would hear that, oh, he's a dilettante, he isn't a serious dancer, or he isn't a serious this, because he was doing all of those things, right? Um, but he isn't even unusual in, in, in African diasporic studies. Um, there are tons of writers, uh, you know, who are also poets, historians, this, that, they wear multiple hats, but he is actually quite extraordinary in that way. And I think he, he understood that he was on, that people didn't quite get him. And I think the gift that he gave us was the archive that he kept of his experiences that we are now using to write, um, uh, to, you know, to do and create new scholarship on his work and his contributions. So he, even though he and Eartha Kitt were in um, Boomerang together, they have a long-standing relationship because he created, he, he directed Timbuktu on Broadway. And this was after Eartha Kitt had been sort of, you know, she had been um, put aside because she made Lady Bird cry. I don't know if we remember the whole situation around that. And she was basically persona non grata in um, American entertainment. And he went and he said, you're fabulous. We're going to create this um, show for you. And they created, um, he created Timbuktu for her. And that was her comeback. And, you know, and, 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 and so goes history. But he was in, in really important um, places. Um, he created incredible work, um, Dougla, uh, for the Dance Theater of Harlem, which the Dance Theater of Harlem still performs. Um, he worked with Alvin Ailey to produce The Prodigal Prince, which um, explored his interest in Haiti and, and was based on the life of the Haitian painter Hector Hippolyte. Um, just incredible, just incredible work in multiple arts sectors. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, here's a question for Dr. Coraline. How does your experience growing up on the island inform your ability to recognize and address the sites of engagement between the speaker and the crux between body and body in transition? Oh, uh, wow. Thank you for the question. Um, it actually made me break out in a sweat a little bit <laughs> um, because I, I did not grow up on the island. And that's one of the struggles that I have dealt with not only as a poet and a writer, but also as an academic. Uh, the permission to speak, I always feel like I need to be given permission to speak as a Boricua, as a Puerto Rican, as a, as a Black woman, especially at, in, on the island where uh, the, the speech is regularly tested against you. I don't sound like a, a Boricua. I don't, I don't have the right accent. So in many ways, my own experience is that it is a troubled uh, crux. It's a constant confrontation. And so when I read within the poets, and I think someone asked about the name of the first poet I discussed, which is Raina Leon, who's a wonderful, wonderful poet. And actually her journal, Ascentos Review, uh, it, it invites the Black poets, uh, Puerto Rican poets, um, uh, you know, people of color to come in and present their work. So she does important work in the poetry community. And like I said, Kave Kanem also does the same work. But yes, I'm not sure if I answer that question, but I feel like I'm in constant transition between different spaces to the point where it almost feels like breaking. And so I'm always looking for poetry that responds to that. And I'm finding academic work that will also respond to that. So thank you very much. Well, I put Rihanna Leon's name in the chat who wanted the name of that per first scholar. Well, it's 4.58. We have two more minutes. Uh, if anybody any other questions, um, comments, announcements, here's your opportunity. But I definitely appreciate all the scholars uh, sharing uh, the information. Uh, definitely would hold it. Of course, The Wiz, another classic, you know, and I guess she helped uh, Eartha Kitt become a Catwoman on Batman after Timbuktu. So, <laughs> and, and, uh, and definitely I teach a hip hop class at, at UF. I teach hip hop studies class myself. So I agree that hip hop is a major form of, of academic legitimate scholarship and, and pedagogy. But I appreciate it. Oh, we go to 515. Okay, that's fine. All right, anybody else any other questions from the crowd? Any other questions or comments from each other as scholars to one another? The floor is open. Oh, here we go. All right, a question for the panel. 
about speculative arts and Afrofuturism in particular, in which imagination generates stories and visions that are supernatural, heroic, otherworldly. Might there be ways to approach the ideas as, quote, this worldly, help us find new ways to act in our current world? That's for everybody. Hmm. Hmm. I'm going to go in the order of my screen. How about Doc, uh, Dr. DeFrance? You start first. <laughs> See how you did that? Thank you. I appreciate you. Uh, yes, yeah, so Afrofuturism, you know, is the counterbalance to Afro-pessimism, of course. This is the world that we imagine and we actually want to move towards. You know, Sankofa doesn't only have to go back to where we become the chattel um, of chattel slavery. Sankofa can also put us in these other, way, other world, otherwise ways to be, uh, which is a, a, a common refrain for Afrofuturists. Um, and then, you know, the idea that it's this worldly, well, actually, it is this worldly. I mean, if you've heard George Clinton and Funkadelic, or you were listening to Prince or paying attention to Patti LaBelle, like, this world is an Afrofuturist world. And, you know, Janelle Monet and here comes Erica Badu, like, it's still here. So mm -hmm. I just want to embrace the here-ness of it. It's all here. Toni Morrison told us it's all now. The history and the implication in Beloved, the future is all right now. Thank you, Erica. Oh, oof. I want to, I'll agree. I thought I was on mute, but I, let me let me quickly agree. But I, I do believe that um, the future is now. I, I think uh, if we want to think of Afrofuturism as, as a kind of theoretical approach, it's it's an old approach. We need we live in its we live in its imaginary right um, now. And I think if I, I would look back on on Jeffrey Holder, um, he would say that we have to possess the space in which we in which we live and imagine. Um, and he there was a he always had a great space saying that he understood as a black person that when that that if he was in a place that he felt he was unwanted he would walk even taller because it will, he he knew that there was nothing wrong with him there was something wrong with the place and that is how he um he went through um life and i think that is all about you know living for today and living in our present and being as um as fa fantastic as we are in an un um, unapologetic way <laughs> marquise So uh, I'm going to take my cue to answer this question from uh, two Afrofuturistic artists and hip hop uh, outcasts. Uh, and one thing I loved about outcast music is uh, they were unapologetically Southern and unapologetically them. So this idea of mixing creativity and culture, no matter what uh, space they were in, that's who they were. And so I think for me, when it comes to uh, this idea of the Black imagination, especially within academia, is so important for scholars of color, uh, in particular Black scholars, to be unapologetically them within their essays, uh, within their poetry, within their performances, because for me, it does two things. It makes space for yourself. It makes uh, this idea of home place, making this space a home for me. Uh, not only uh, not you know not being a distant cousin, but like if I'm going to be here, especially for an extended period of time, let me make a space for myself. But then also too, it's uh, also like a bread cramp, bread crumb trail for the scholars that look like you to come in the future. Um, because I remember reading uh, one of my first uh, uh, Mark Anthony Neal. He's a big hip hop studies scholar. Reading his work and it was a breath of fresh air. It was like wow, I can is this is this within this space too. And so I think uh, when it comes to uh, just black scholars and the black imagination, creativity and culture must come together and we must be unapologetically ourselves, even if it sometimes makes other people, people feel uncomfortable. So, so yeah. Uh, should I try to answer it? I, I think everyone answered it wonderfully. <laughs> um, but one one thing I wanted to say was that I also I, I love the word unapologetic because it also means that there's an honesty that comes through. So while in a lot of their earlier Puerto Rican poets, who I'm not taking anything away from, uh, there was sort of like the the poster Puerto Rico, and I, I even my parents also did that too. There was the 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 place to go that was different from the site where you were living. So there was this utopian kind of uh, presentation of island. And I think that today's writers are, are confronting that and they're actually saying, wait, well, the, here are the problematics with that. And, and they're, they're changing that pace. So while 
uh, the way I see it is after futuristic is that there's an honesty that comes through. That is not uh, the home place is the home place, but you're going to also know the truth in the home place. You're on mute, Professor Canton. I got. I should know. Two years in, I should know this by now. I apologize. <laughs> Dr. McFerguson mentions building a bridge for scholarship between the community and, schol and scholarship. We hope moments like this panel can work as one example of how publishers can be part of building that bridge. And what other ways can academic publishers help to build that bridge? Wow, so that's a, a phenomenal question. And um, I, I think I had one of my mentors <laughs> said, uh, you know, people in power, you know, who talk about diversity and uh, equity and inclusion, you know, if you're not going to be serious about it, stop talking about it, right? And so I think at some point, some people have to pay their money where their mouth is. And I think the way we can do this, I think one example uh, is possibly hope, uh, hosting panels like this where you invite graduate students to uh, listen to scholars talk about their writing process uh, both, uh, and also their successes and their failures. Uh, I'm hosting a panel uh, in the fall that kind of explores this idea of award-winning black scholars, but then what is the publishing process like? Because, you know, in most of our fields is publish or perish. And so we read about these scholars, but we never really get to understand the backstory of their writing process, how they write, um, what things work for them, um, how to submit, you know, target certain journals, stuff like that. And so I think having a panel where you can kind of demystify the publishing process and, um, you know, people, graduate students can get to talk to these award-winning scholars can be very important. Also, it builds a bridge between those scholars and the students. And so it's not just like, oh, I know how I felt when I would see some scholars. It's like, oh, I'm not worthy to be talked to because I'm a lowly graduate student. But so many times those scholars are willing to do mm. whatever they can to help you get to, you know, be successful and uh, tenured. And not just, once again, for me, not just survive in academy, and barely make it, but thrive in the academy. So I think that would be a, a wonderful panel to have. Uh, also a panel where you have uh, not only scholars, but also other uh, publishers uh, and presses come together and talk about and demystify the publishing process for graduate students, because that's the future. So, you know. Question for Dr. De France. France, can you talk more about your critique of autoethnography and the way it is increasingly becoming a popular methodology? How do we keep it from slipping into pure navel gazing and rather than dialogues and community? Okay, well, I'll try to be brief. I appreciate the question. I did try to raise something that would be a little bit of a, a, a thorny space. So, you know, you caught that. Okay. Um, I don't know about navel gazing because that sounds super dismissive and I'm not here. I'm definitely not going to lift up like um, trying to put someone else in their place or something like that. People need to tell the stories they need to tell. Um, a question we have around is like writing in the civil rights era and now we're in the social justice era, if you will, you know, let's say if we accept that as just a way to think about, you know, just between 50 years ago and now, um, you know, so the, the researchers who were able to write and publish 50 years ago was this much smaller group of people. And there was this sense of you had to be essentially representing the race. So we hadn't really moved that far from Du Bois except the race was more of us, like, you know, people who were first gen, people who were just getting up from the Caribbean, like, you know, there were just more people back in the 60s who were publishing for the first time. But now with so many more people, you know, the population plants twice as many, so there's just more people. So even though Black Americans, we're still 12% of the population, but it's 12% of a much bigger number. So it's like, we're actually more people. So there's more people who can actually uh, figure out how to publish and tell stories. Maybe what, what we might want to do is figure out how to share our stories so we can focus on where we're entangled and where we're alongside each other. Of course, how we're different. We all have different ways to think about um, ideas, but sharing the ideas towards a kind of collective good, that's what, I, that's what I want to try to lift up. Rather than it's, you know, what popular media does or reality TV, you share your ideas just so you can kind of, you know, make your way to the next day. So to follow my colleague from before, not just uh, surviving, but thriving, thriving in our, our explorations of self and sharing those stories alongside each other towards some sort of collective good. Okay. Next, Dr. Have, King. Yes. Can, 
since that is my primary primary methodology, can I just say a, a small tidbit about that? Go ahead. Uh, not, um, I believe uh, I, I agree with Dr. DeFrance um, that when it comes to autoethnography, um, I always say good autoethnography is like a, a, a solo that is uh, a part of a larger chorus. So it should not be just your own personal story, but it should be, uh, as uh, Muhammad Ali would say in a short, beautiful poem, uh, I is we, right? So this I connected to the we. Uh, and so I think I, I agree with Dr. Uh, DeFrance when he says that, um, and it, it should not just be your own your own story just about you. It should be a larger story that uh, un unfolds into a larger cultural phenomenon. Uh, so, so yeah. Okay, questions for all. This might take us to 515, our last question. Diaspora authors and artists are necessarily trans multidisciplinary. Can you speak more about this value, worth, Caribbean and African diaspora? So we'll start with Jane and then we'll end on uh, Dr. DeFrance. Well, thinking about the writers that I'm working on now towards this paper, um, it, they are definitely uh, multidisciplinary in that you see them not only publishing their poetry or writing poetry, but also uh, working in the community, uh, working in the academic, writing, uh, writing academic papers, uh, they're performance artists also, so they, they perform their work uh, throughout the U.S. And, and outside of the U.S. And so I, 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 I think their, their worth is completely taken up by all sort of sort of like all hands on deck activity and i if if we're thinking about what we uh, what you all had contributed earlier as far as self care um i think it's part of self care i think the only reason that their hands are in all the doughs right is that you can't not be part of it like, there's so many ways to be heard. And I think the, the contemporary artist finds those ways, just as uh, we heard about Jeffrey Holder. It's almost, I don't want to use the word instinctual, but I guess I have to because I can't come up with another one. <laughs> I could sit at home and only write my poems and be satisfied, but I'm not. <laughs> I, I feel in some ways we are also uh, we put that on ourselves to be almost layered, multi-layered. We, we can't be not multi-layered. Thank you. I don't know if I answered that question, but. Okay. Uh, next, we have Marquise on that question. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Um, I think... Um, and this kind of connects back to the whole ideal autoethnography. I think most research is personal. Um, and I think when it comes to especially black scholars and them being uh, uh, having multiple uh, disciplines or multidisciplinary, um, I believe that you have to, um, as they used to say in the old black church, come as you are. You know, and I think if you have multiple ways to express yourself within academic spaces, I don't see anything wrong with that, especially if you are able to weave uh, a thread and a line that aligns all your research underneath this umbrella, then there should be no limits to how you express yourself, whether it be in um, performance or poetry, especially if these things are peer reviewed and if amongst the jury of your peers, if this is deemed academic and quality work, then um, why put yourself inside the box um, and, and uh, limit yourself to how you express yourself and um, uh, share your art, because I also believe scholarship is also a work of art, even if it's an essay, the way that you put together extended metaphors in the essay and the way that you develop imagery in the essay is a work of art. So why should you limit yourself? I think I think it's necessary if, if you uh, um, if that is how you choose to express yourself. Okay, thank you, Erica. Yeah, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm, I, one of the reasons I'm so fascinated with, um, with Holder is the fact that he insists on being a multimodal artist. Um, he, will, he would have told, said that you know, his painting grounds everything, 
but his creative mind, the activity, the need to express, the ideas that he wanted to express had to come out how they came out. And sometimes it, it was in choreography, sometimes it was um, in, in painting, sometimes it was in um, dance or, 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 or acting, but it had to come out. But what we have also found is just looking at the way he is thinking, concepts that we think are very discreet um, inform all of these arts. So for instance, the line, we think of lines when we're drawing, et cetera. But when you look at the body and dance, you almost can see them drawing lines. You know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful um, sort of idea. And just the, 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 the possibility of thinking across um, those, those, those mediums by taking a single element um, just enriches our experience and our uh, uh, imagination. So this has been incredibly fun um, too, because I think it's been, it's, it challenges the way that we see and the kind of boxes and frames that the academy tends to put uh, work in. What happens when diasporic artists blow those frames up and how do we account for that? So that's, that's why we are excited by this because we think we, there's a way to do it. If we think of the work itself as a theoretical form. Yeah, all right, Brother Thomas, like the Black church says, bring us home, brother, bring us home. <laughs> bring us home with a little bit of the beat. <laughs> Black aesthetics believes in rhythm. We believe in the beat. We believe that if we can manipulate and care for the beat, we can change our destiny. Of course, we're more multimodal. Of course, we're multidisciplinary. We believe in art making as study, as craft, as presence, as relationship. And I just want to lift up the abundance of this conversation with all the grace I can muster. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Great way to great way to end. I appreciate all the scholars, everybody a hand, a claps, put something in a reaction. Well done. And uh, you had a great time, learned a lot, and we hope to see y'all in the future. Yes, thank you. Many, many thanks to our moderator, David Canton, and to each of our panelists for sharing your work and for this uh, conversation. Um, uh, one second. I've, uh, um, I also want to thank the UF African American Studies Program, the UF Center for Latin American Studies, and the UF Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere for partnering with the University Press of Florida on this event. And many thanks to the National Endowment for the Humanities for making this event possible through its grant program, Sustaining the Humanities Through the American Rescue Plan. A recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, Florida Press, a link to the recording will be sent to all webinar registrants within the next few days. To receive updates and registration information for future webinars in this virtual event series, visit upress.ufl.edu and sign up for our NEH Sharp event series email list. Thank you for attending and have a good evening. <laughs>